got your Bibles, you probably find it quite helpful to have them and to have them open at Hebrews chapters 1 and 2. Last week, if you were here, last week I spoke about um, when we're angry at God, angry with him that he doesn't do for us what we think he should be doing, why he did some things for others and doesn't seem to be doing them for ourselves. Tonight, I want to talk about when we feel cheesed off with the church. Do you ever feel cheesed off with the church? I do, but then I feel cheesed off with life in general. So um, I was watching the marathon last week. I don't know why it was, but I turned the television on and I just saw it was the start of the world athletics, starting with the marathon. So I thought, well, I'll just watch one event. About two and a quarter hours later, <laughs> turned it off. But you see all these people there in Osaka in uh, Japan, and they all started off, and they were full of fitness and energy and health and vigor and vim and zeal, and they all started running the marathon. And you saw them two and a quarter hours later finishing the marathon. And those who were coming in, the adrenaline was pumping. They were there, the finishing uh, tape was in sight, and they could keep going. But for the 30 kilometers in the middle, well, that was sheer hard work, wasn't it? When the heat is so hot and the feet are getting blisters and it's mile after mile after mile. It's hard mile after hard mile, hard slog after hard slog. So easy to give up, you know, when you hit the 30 kilometer barrier, you say, well, that's enough. <laughs> I, I don't want to run 42 kilometers, <laughs> that's enough. I'll, I'll just give up now, thank you, and I'll go home. It would have been so easy to give up because it's hard work in the middle. And that sounds so much like church life, doesn't it? It's exciting when you become a Christian. Everything's new, everything's exciting, it's wonderful. And then near the end of your life, when you're going to glory, and you know that the next thing is heaven, well, that's a bit daunting, I know, because you've got to go through death to get there, but it's something to look forward to. But in the middle, you know, to live above with saints we love, that will be glory. To dwell below with saints we know, well, that's a different story. And it certainly is. I used to read church history to inspire me. I would read about Wycliffe and Huss. I would read about Luther and Calvin. I would read about Baxter and Bunyan, Whitfield and Wesley, Spurgeon and McChain, and these people who shook nations, shook continents, shook generations. David Livingstone, Hudson Taylor. It was so exciting. But then as I read more, I learned that it wasn't all a story of success and romance. Yeah. In between the exciting bits... There were the fights and squabbles. And as I read church history, I found that Christians, good Christians, could fall out over absolutely everything. It didn't matter what it was, they could fall out over it. They started by falling out over the date of Easter, and over the communion service, and then over the method of baptism, and the amount of water, and church government. They've fallen out about who can preach, where they can preach, when they can preach, how long they should preach, or what they should wear. We uh, find that they've fallen out over what to sing, spiritual gifts, and on and on we could go. We find church splits and church fights, and it breaks our hearts just to read about them. So what it must have felt like living through them, I don't know. But you get the point. Sometimes we can be very ashamed of our history. We can be ashamed of the bigotry and prejudice that has filled the church at some time. The silence for century after century over slavery. The, the toleration of racism. Thankfully, we have turned from these. Thankfully, God raised up Christian reformers that led the way to putting these things right. But we sometimes think, how could Christians behave like that? How could John Bradford say that Baptists should be burned at the stake for baptizing people by total emotion? I don't know, he was a keen reformer, but felt so strongly about these things. And he said, well, do I want to be associated with this history? And then we look from the past to the present. Um, we can get upset by the problems that there are in the church today. So many petty problems in the church today. We squabble over Bible versions. 
whether we can lift up our hands or lift up two hands or no hands when we sing songs. We can argue about what colour we should paint the loose, what kind of coffee we should have after the services. We hear about church members' meetings that seem to have come straight from hell itself. And we think, do I really want to be a part of this organisation? Do I really, really want to be a part of this? I don't know if you've ever seen the film The Dish. I enjoyed seeing the film The Dish. A bit slow, but I really enjoyed it. And it's about when the Americans sent, you know, the people to walk on the moon for the first time. And they wanted to beam the uh, satellite picture so that we could watch it on the television. I can remember as a little boy getting up watching it on the television. The problem was that the moon was there and the earth was here, but America was at the wrong side of the earth to receive the television signals when they were walking on the moon. So the Americans had to send people from NASA to Australia to a little village that seemed to have a massive big satellite dish. Why they had the satellite dish in the middle of nowhere, nobody seems to know, but they had it, and NASA sent their specialists there, and they could receive the television, the satellite pictures for our television. The problem was the squabbling that was going on in, in this, uh, as where the dish was there in that village in Australia. And at one point, one of the men just says to the others, look, he says, Something like this. He said, look, we are about something of global significance and you are arguing about who can hold the radio. Grow up. And they think, well, that should be said to the church. We are about something of eternal significance and we're arguing about whether we should have filter coffee or not. Let's grow up. We can feel sometimes that the church <sighs> is so petty. The early church had these problems. You know, there were the Hebrew-speaking Jews arguing against the Greek-speaking Jews, saying that there was favoritism and they were splitting up. Ah, oh dear. I heard of a church that had a split over a harvest supper because one of the elders was sitting next to a young girl at the harvest supper, and when they handed round the plates with ham on it, the girl next to the elder had a bigger piece of ham than the elder had. And the elder complained, said, I'm an elder. I should have a bigger piece than she has. And others said, you're an elder, you should keep quiet. And it caused problems. Then it caused tension. Then it caused division. And do you think, well, do I really want to be a member of a group where they love each other so much that they will divide over the size of a piece of ham and a salad? And do I really want to be a part of that? And we get so cheesed off with it all that we can think, well, we're better off without it. And then we think, not only are we ashamed of so many things that the church has or hasn't done, and so much of the pettiness and infighting that can fill the church today, and then, then when we think of the pressures involved in being part of the church, yeah, we've got to go to meetings when we're tired, and when there's football on the telly, and we've got to have extra commitments when... Oh, we're busy enough as it is. And we've got to give generously when we don't want to give anything at all. And we've got to love those we can't even stand. And we've got to give up every Sunday for public worship. And oh, it's got to sing the same old songs yet again. And so we get to the point where we feel it's so hard work. And then we're frightened of the opposition that is coming from society. Soon, we might be arrested for attending meetings like this. I might be sent to prison for what I say on matters of sexuality, matters of false religion, and all these things. You might come to church and have nice service and go out and get fined. And you think, is it really worth it? Do I really want all this stress? Do I really want all these problems? It'd be much easier just to be a Christian on my own, just me and God. Wouldn't that be nice? They didn't be like, I can worship God in my garden. I'm nearer to God in my garden than anywhere else on earth. Well, why bother belonging with the Christians? And then I could do what I like with my Sundays. Just think of that. I could have church on the beach all on my own, sunbathing. Isn't that wonderful? Rather than being in a stuffy church sitting next to someone who's a bit too big. I can do what I like with my money. I can do what I like with my evenings. I can choose my friends. Honestly, who wants to be a part of the church when you can do it all on your own? And it sounds so exciting. Church can be a pain in the neck. 
And it's embarrassing when the preacher starts yelling, I think I'll do without it. Now that's just how these Hebrew Christians were feeling in the first century when the letter of the Hebrews was written to them. Indeed, some of them had stopped meeting together and were doing their own thing. And they were slipping back to their old ways. And the writer tells them that this is very dangerous. These are the symptoms of those who fall away. It's very serious. He says, these are battles, precious temptations we will all face. And we mustn't turn away because it's dangerous for us. And it's disastrous for the church. And it's discouraging to the people we love. And it's a bad witness in society. So we mustn't do it. We mustn't become deserters on the battlefield who discourage the believers. So don't give up. Don't shrink back. Don't fall away. He says, no, he says, what you must do is you must consider Jesus Christ who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. He says you mustn't grow weary and lose heart. The problem is that you are considering the church. And if you consider the church, it's not surprising you'll have, you know, lose heart. Because all you've got is a bunch of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sinners. So don't consider the church. Consider Jesus Christ. That's what you should be doing. Josh McDowell was an atheist at university, and he noticed a pretty girl whose life seemed to radiate something special. And so he asked her, what is the cause of all your joy? Jesus Christ, she said. Oh, don't give me that religion, he replied. I didn't say religion, she responded. I said Jesus. And here's our problem. When we focus on the church... We will get cheesed off, but when we focus on Jesus, it will change our perspective completely. We see first of all in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is in a different league from everybody else. Moses and Elijah, David and Abraham were Old Testament greats, but they don't compare to Jesus Christ. God spoke through the prophets, like the sun shining through the window. But God spoke by his son. It's not that Jesus is a different window pane that the light shines through, but he's like the sun in the sky that the light shines by, that it shines down through the window. Jesus isn't just another Jesus is the great Son of God. God spoke through the prophets and by his own Son. And this is because of who Jesus Christ is. And here, in these next three verses, he tells us seven things about Jesus Christ. First of all, Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. Everything exists for him. It belongs to him. Secondly, God made the universe through Jesus Christ. He was in the beginning with God the Father. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. He is the creator of all things. Thirdly, Jesus Christ is the radiance of God's glory. So that when Saul of Tarsus saw the risen Lord Jesus Christ, he was blinded by the glory of God. To look at Jesus is to see God. And fourthly, Jesus is the image of of the invisible God. He's the exact representation of God. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus Christ. As Jesus told his disciple Philip, he said, if you've seen me, Philip, you have seen the Father. And fifthly, Jesus Christ sustains all things by his powerful word. He controls all things. He gives us Life. He enables the stars to hang in space. He enables the fish to swim in the sea. His word created everything in the beginning, and his word controls everything in the present. And sixthly, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He has made forgiveness for us, and now he reigns in the place of power. Indeed, it's the place of all power. He sits at the right hand of God. And seventhly, Jesus is superior to the 
angels. The mightiest archangel is his servant. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is God the Son. That's the introduction to the book of Hebrews, which brings us to what the writer to the Hebrews wants as his first point, which we notice in chapter 1, verses 5 to 14, that Jesus is above the angels. It's very important that we understand this. If our view of Jesus Christ is of the pale Galilean, then we don't have an adequate understanding of who Jesus Christ really is. And so the writer to the Hebrews, having told us seven things about Jesus Christ in verses 1 to 4, he now gives us seven Old Testament quotations in verses 5 to 14 that tell us about Jesus' superiority to the angels in every part of his life. It starts there in eternity past, where Jesus is the Son of God. And still in eternity past, secondly, in the divine economy, as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit planned everything together, the Father took the role of being the Father, and the Word took the role of being the Son of God. And then, thirdly, in verse 6, at Jesus' birth, the angels sang his praises. Hark, the herald angels sing. And then fourthly, after Jesus' temptations, and there in the Garden of Gethsemane, the angels came and ministered to him. They were his servants. And then fifthly, in verses 8 and 9, at his ascension, where Jesus was raised up to the throne of glory and declared with power to be the Son of God. So God the Father said to him, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. And then sixthly, at the end of time, verses 10 to 12, he deals with creation. He rolls it all up. The heaven he will just roll up as you would roll up your shirt when it's dirty at night time to throw it in the dirty clothes basket. And seventhly, all his enemies are made his footstool. Every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you see who Jesus Christ is? He's far above the angels. But then we read in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 9, thirdly, that Jesus became lower than the angels. So what he wants you to understand this is why he's made such a point of showing that Jesus is greater, superior to the angels, because now he tells us that Jesus became lower than the angels. He laid aside his glory. He humbled himself. He took on human flesh. He left the glory of heaven to be born in the stable at Bethlehem, where he, he wore the likeness of sinful human flesh. He was made a little lower than the angels, we read there in verse 9. Jesus, as a toddler, had to learn to speak. He got hungry. He would bleed when he cut himself on a chisel in Joseph's carpentry shop. He got tired. He became distressed. He died. No angel ever walked such a lowly path. No angel ever stooped so low. For centuries, people have dreamed of drinking the elixir of eternal youth. They want to be like the angels. But Jesus Christ was like the angels. He was above the angels. And yet, he became mortal man. He was made flesh. He was made a little lower than the angels. Why? Why he who was superior to the angels was made lower than the angels? Well, we're told, fourthly, in verse, chapter 2, verses 10 to 18, Jesus did this. To rescue us. We can't save ourselves. We can hate our sin. We can turn from our sin. But we cannot forgive our sins. And God can't just forgive us our sins either. Just as God cannot lie and remain holy, remain God. So he cannot cheat and remain holy and remain God. So if God is going to forgive sins without cheating, he has to deal with our sins so that they can be forgiven. Sin must be punished, and therefore the Savior must suffer and pay our debt. And so we read in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 to 13, that Jesus became human to be our representative. 
Now, if I got caught stealing the church funds and John Dowler's treasurer grabs me by the scruff of the neck and, and, and drags me off to court, and at court I am accused of having stolen the millions of Lansdowne Baptist Church, and the judge says, right, Chris, we're going to throw you into, hev into heaven, into, into prison for 10 years. I say, okay, but my goldfish will serve the sentence for me. He said, I'm afraid <laughs> that's no good. Your goldfish, both of them together, can't be substitutes for you. But if my brother says, Caroline would miss Chris so much, how would she manage to live without him? I'll serve his prison sentence for him. And says to the judge, I will take his place locked up in prison. The judge can then say, okay, because my brother is a suitable representative. He can be my substitute. And so the son of God, who is vastly superior to the angels, became lower than the angels and took on human flesh. He became man to become our brother, to become your representative, to be your substitute, to be your savior, because you couldn't save yourself. But it didn't end there. Secondly, Jesus Christ became human to die, verses 14 to 16, because the wages of sin is death. And therefore, to forgive sins, the Savior had to die. But God cannot die. He is immortal. He is the God who cannot die. Angels can't die. But we do. So God left the glory of heaven. And the second person of the Trinity was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem as a human being, born to die, born to go to the cross, born to be crucified, so that by his death he might rescue you from your sin, to rescue you from death, and Satan. You see why he became lower than the angels? To be our representative, to be our rescuer, but it doesn't stop there. Look for verses 17 and 18. Thirdly, Jesus Christ became human to become our high priest. He wasn't merely going to represent us. He wasn't merely going to rescue us. He was going to restore us to our relationship with God. He is the mediator the merciful and faithful high priest who helps us. He's made atonement. That means he brings us back to God. He brings us at one with God. He restores us into the family of God and into fellowship with God. This is why Jesus Christ became man. This is why he became lower than the angels. So that one day we will be lifted up higher than the angels. We will be back in fellowship with God in heaven. So we don't drop out of the marathon. We don't say, oh, this is hard work of these people. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. No, when we feel cheesed off with the church, we consider who Jesus Christ is. We remember who he is. And that gives us two massive obligations the verses we missed out first of all negatively chapter 2 verses 1 to 4 don't neglect such a great salvation you see we've always been pressurized to backpedal and it looks so attractive to backpedal and i just do my own thing i'll go at my pace and i'll worship god as i like with who i like where i like i just do my own thing but this is not the way that jesus christ lives and this is not the way he calls us to live either. Because if we just do that, we, we will start to drift. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. No, we don't just say, I'm going to withdraw. I'm going to have my own little life and my own little uh, circle. I, I, I'm going to uh, neglect such a great salvation. No, we can't. Because if we do, we will soon have made shipwreck of our lives. So we've got to stick it out because of Jesus so negatively, we don't ignore such a great salvation. And positively, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. 
If you're ever driving along the road with someone and they're talking to you and they get so engrossed in what they're talking to that they look at you, you say, fix your eyes on the road, don't you? Don't look at me, fix your eyes on the road. And the writer to the Hebrews here, he's saying to them, fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't look at him, don't look at her, don't look at them. Fix your eyes on Jesus. We tell musicians, fix your eyes on the conductor. And the Bible tells Christians here in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1, fix your thoughts on Jesus. The word here for fix your thoughts, fix your attention on Jesus, is a word that was used of astronomers. In those days, if they wanted to plot the movement of the stars across the sky, they had to concentrate on them night after night after night after dark night. They had to fix their eyes on the stars. And he tells us to fix our thoughts on Jesus Christ. And if we fix our eyes upon Jesus Christ, who is incredibly superior to Moses or anybody else on earth or any angel in heaven, then we will not grow weary and lose heart. Fix your eyes upon Jesus Christ and think of him in his deity as God and in his humanity as man. Think of his person and his work that he, the Son of God, came to save sinners. See him radiating God's glory. See him at creation as he speaks the universe into being. See him controlling all things today, upholding the laws of nature, giving your heart permission to beat, your lungs permission to breathe, your brain permission to work. He upholds and sustains all things. And see him one day grabbing hold of the universe and just rolling it up like you would roll a towel up when you come back from the beach. See him bearing human flesh and dying for our sins upon the cross of Calvary. See him being our mediator, hanging between heaven and earth, bearing the sin of man and the wrath of God and the curse of the law and the hostility of hell. And see him there rescuing us from death and Satan and bringing us to God, bringing many sons to glory. And what you do when you see Jesus Christ like that, what you do is you get down on your knees and say, I give my whole life to Jesus Christ. It's a privilege to be a part of his family. This motley crew of the church is his people, his family, his body, and his brothers and sisters, I'm privileged to call my brothers and sisters. And his friends are my friends. And his work is my work. And I am privileged to be in his kingdom, in his family, called by his name. And so I give my life for him. Give up, put my hands in my pocket and say, forget the church of Christ now. I give everything to Jesus Christ and count it to be a privilege to be a part of his church. What keeps us from growing weary and losing heart? Because you really like the people sitting in front of you or behind you? It's because of Jesus Christ, who is superior to the angels, who became lower than the angels to be your representative be your rescuer, to restore you to God. Let's follow him. Let's live for him. Let's love him.